Welcome into another live edition of Locked on Baylor as the Bears drop a 30 to 18 contest against Iowa State and it wasn't even that close. Let's do the theme music. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day, and especially on game day. I'm Cam Stewart, here to break down yet another loss for the Baylor Bears, their fifth of the season, and the bold dreams that were fleeting already, but we were still clinging on to, are gone. Gonzo, man. If you think Baylor's making a bowl game this year, you are in banana land. But it's your month, because it's Mental Health Awareness Month. I have mental health problems, too, but they're different than that, okay? Maybe worse. This was pathetic again. I don't I don't know how else to say it. I, I think as opposed to some other bad Baylor teams in the past, this team doesn't necessarily beat themselves. They don't shoot themselves in the foot. They don't commit stupid penalties. They don't drop easy passes necessarily. They're just not good. They don't drop easy passes, but they're not open. They don't commit holding penalties because they're letting guys through the line. They just stink. They just stink on all ends of the field and every facet of the game, they are not a good football team. And it was just, I don't know. I, again, the, the, the hopefulness of this past week was not like, Hey, this team's going to go to eight and four on the year championship, but you're like, Hey, we saw some positive things. Finally, maybe that can carry over to a home game on homecoming against a team that is better than you, but is beatable. And that just didn't happen. At no point was Baylor really in this game. I know they scored a fourth quarter touchdown and, uh, you know, got it. I kind of tweeted out that it, that it got close, but it didn't because then they missed the two point conversion right after that. Let's, let's start with the two point conversions. It's obviously not, you know, the, the biggest part of the game. And I haven't listed third here on the rundown, but I, I just didn't get it. I didn't get it. So they score. So they missed the first extra point, which makes it 17-6, to six, which, by the way, great stat by Eric Kelly of Fox 44. The only team to score less than seven points against Iowa State in the first half this year is yours, mine, our Baylor Bears. Only team to do it. And they have faced Iowa. The worst offense in the country. They even scored more than we did against them in the first half. So they missed that extra point. That was a rain thing. I'm not really getting on Isaiah Hankins too much for that one. but. Then they score again in the second half, and they go for two and miss it. And it's like, okay. I don't remember what the score was at that time. But then when it's 27 to 12, Baylor scores again to make it 27 to 18, and they go for two. I kind of understand that. You need to go for two at some point. I I don't know that that's the best time to do it. I, I don't love when coaches do that, when they say, we got to go for two at some point. And I know why they do it early because they're like, hey, this will set us up for the last couple minutes of the game. But it could also knock you out of the game, which is almost what it did for Baylor because they miss it. It's a it's a bobbled ball on a, on a shuffle pass. And instead, it's 27-18. It doesn't really matter when you let Iowa State go down and score, which is what they did. Now, it was just a field goal. So let's do the math here, Okay. If Baylor kicks the extra point, makes it, it's 27 to 19, and then 30 to 19. So in that case, it's a two-score game, which it still is at 30 to 18, but it goes from, hey, we can score a score touchdown, go for two, and then potentially have a game-tying field goal to now we need to score two touchdowns. That's a monumental difference, and you've put yourself in that hole by going for two at 27 to 18. So that one, I, I didn't really get, uh, but there were plenty bigger issues. That, that was not the reason that Baylor lost this game. And so I put it out on Twitter. What do you guys want to talk about in this post game? How the O-line is this bad? I, I didn't think they were that bad today. They're not good. <laughs> That's for sure. But I didn't think they were that bad today. Maybe I'm wrong on that one. Can we talk about who we can afford as our next coach to be after Dave's buyout in a month or so. Don't know. 
That's one of those things where you're looking for who is going to be, you know, the, the power five coach that kind of comes out of nowhere. The way Tulane came out of nowhere and won the Cotton Bowl last year. We'll know a little bit more in a few weeks uh, in terms of who to target for that if they do move on from Dave Aranda after this season. Want to talk about 2021? I mean, not really. It was great. It was fantastic. I was there, but it doesn't do much for us now. Why Mac Rhodes should get to keep his job if Aranda isn't fired? I like Mac Rhodes. I do. And I don't think it's on him if they can't afford the buyout. I don't. Um, I think we were all in the same boat to extend Aranda after 2021. Hindsight's 2020. It was not a great move. And they, I don't think they can afford the buyout. I think that's why Aranda is going to be your head coach next year. And I don't know that that has to do with Mac Rhodes. Aranda is, but I don't know what you want me to say to that one. I mean, he hasn't done a great job this year. I, I don't know what the <laughs> what the discussion point is there. So another thing I want to point out, I've already pointed out the not dumb, just bad, two-point conversions, the 60-yard touchdown by Monterey Baldwin, a great point by Mo Porter, former Baylor player in the, in the Bryles era, and then uh, for Jim Grobe as well, I believe, in 2016. He, he posted on Twitter. He said, I look down when Monterey Baldwin scores the 60-yard touchdown to put some life back in this team, or so you think, and nobody on the sidelines is, is celebrating. They can't be arsed that they just scored a 60-yard touchdown and they're back in the game, or so you thought. That has been there all season long. And it's been talked about. I've talked about it on this show. Drake talked about it on Locked On Big 12, and he got a bunch of heat for it. But it's true. And their teammates, are Monterey Baldwin two weeks ago, was basically saying as much. We've got three weeks ago. Guys who are along for the ride, that's, that's where it shows. I mean, if you can't get excited for your guys making a big play, you're not, you're not in the right place. You shouldn't be playing the game. This is something that coaches get mad about all the time. And I saw someone uh, replied back to me um, that, that mirrors their head coach. Maybe that's true. But we saw the energy in 2021. We saw the energy last year. You know, it wasn't a great team last year, but there was certainly energy there. You weren't saying, boy, this team's given up. But you see it this year. So I don't know if that's mirroring the head coach or a team just being broken down by this crap season. And that's not a good enough excuse because there's still things to play for or there were before today. And it just sucks that even with the lack of energy in the stadium and around this program, that we as the fan base are more ready on Saturdays for the football game than seemingly than the team is, or more excited about the football game than the team is, or more excited about when we're scoring than the freaking team is. Like, what are we doing, man? Why, why is it pulling teeth to get you guys to get fired up? It's so disheartening. And it made me think about back in the Bryles days and, and even some after, even in the rule days. But you remember those guys who, who weren't dressing and they'd be on the sidelines. They'd have the towels. They're going nuts. Sometimes they'd have the mask. And, and they were always getting hyped for not only the touchdowns, but the kickoffs. And they were getting the fans into it. It seemed corny. It seemed cheesy at the time. But it wasn't disingenuous. It wasn't at all. I mean, clearly that, that helped the team. It helped the fans and therefore helped the product on the field. And now again, I mean, even the guys who are dressed can't get excited for their teammates or won't get excited for their teammates. There's clearly no consequences for the lack of energy or failure. That seems to be right. It seems to be reinforced because week after week, we're seeing it. They're, they're A, they're not ready to play ever, ever. And you're just hoping that on a game like today, that it's only 10 nothing rather than what it became in 17 to nothing. You're, you're just hoping you keep in striking distance because you know you're going to fall behind every game. And yeah, Scott, the, the urgency needs to be better for this Baylor team. That's absolutely right because it's the same crap every week. I come on here, win, lose, or draw. They weren't ready to play the football game again, again. And the big difference in the, st in the stats today, because the stats are not that bad. It doesn't look like a blowout, even though it was a blowout. Oh my God, stupid thing. Hold on, I need to get the stats now because stat broadcast went down. So, was third down. That was the big, what the hell, man? 
Why is it not popping up on BaylorStats.com? This is my own personal torture today. Here we go. Sorry about that, guys. Pulling up the stats from today's game. And the number that I look at, let's look at total yards, 400 for Iowa State. That's a lot. But 306 for Baylor. So not a total blowout there. It's a lot. Uh, Baylor out pass yards them, if that makes sense, by one, 239, 238, 67 rushing yards again for Baylor. They're not going to rush for 100 yards again this season. Sorry. Penalties, nothing on the Baylor side. Two for 11 yards, four for 18 at Iowa State. Pretty even game in that category. Pretty clean game. 19 to 17 in first downs. Nothing bad about that. They each ran the same number of plays, 66 for each. And the average yards per play is not good for Baylor. It's 6.1 for Iowa State, but 4.6 on your end. So not terrible. Iowa State has seven more minutes of possession. The stat that just knocks me on the floor, third down, Baylor, four, four for 14. Iowa State, 9 for 15 on the money downs. And you'll say, oh, Cam, if I look down one line further, Baylor's 3 for 6 on fourth down. Yeah, Iowa State didn't have to attempt one because they didn't need to punt. (laughs) They didn't get to fourth down. 9 for 15 on third down. That's the money down. You know what that tells me? It tells me a lot of things. tells me (laughs) you don't have good enough personnel, first off. Because when third down, when team comes to third down, you know they're looking for their number one guy, and Baylor can't match up. That means they don't have any leaders on the field. I mean, that's apparent in other phases of the game, but on third down, they can't get a stop. That, that tells me there is just a lack of focus, a lack of concentration, a lack of leadership on the field. And, I mean, the elephant in the room on this one is they're third and shorts because you're not stopping them on first or second down. So it's easy when a team can do that all freaking day long against you. Nine for 15 on third down. That is so unserious. That will, you will never win a game when you're letting the other team go nine for 15 on third down. Never. A 50% on third down is not a bad day at the office. <laughs> they went 60%. <laughs> 50% is a good day. They went for 60 and we're kind of cruising towards the end of this. I think it was nine for 13 at one point when they scored that final uh, field goal to put things away. So just not good in any sense of the word for Baylor. Um, I thought the weather would play a factor in that if you took them out of the passing game with the heavy rain, that it was definitely going to favor Iowa State. It was didn't, didn't matter too much anyway. And the, the defensive series that did it for me that I said – yeah, probably not Baylor's day. And they did score a few after that was the first possession of the second half. Y'all remember that one? Because Iowa State got a negative play. I think it was a run play to go to second and 14. Then a false start to go to second and 19. Three plays later, they were in the freaking end zone. <laughs> like you, you you can't even make this up. This is This is what FCS teams do or should be doing against Baylor early in the season. Not what Baylor is doing in a Big 12 game. And instead, this is the crap that you get every week. Blake Shapin wasn't on it today. First time since he's come back that we that he really just hasn't been sharp. 24 for 41 for 239. A touchdown and a pick, his first pick of the year. And in the second half, in the third quarter it was, he throws one 30 yards down the field into quadruple coverage. I'm not kidding, y'all. Four defensive backs on this receiver in the middle of the field. What, what I mean, that's like throwing up the white flag. I mean, if you're getting that desperate, what are we going to do? On the other side, Rocco Beck, 19 of 31, 238 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Essentially the same stat line. And his team won by 12, and they were never really in jeopardy. You're two leading rushers for Iowa State, each with 10 or more carries, so no flukes here. Sanders and Norton each go for over five yards a carry. 5.8 for Norton, 6.4 for Sanders. This defense sucks. Sucks. Cannot stop a runny nose, let alone anybody's rushing attack. And I was afraid about it even after last week's win. I said, until they can fix this, the teams are never going to need to get into second gear. 
it's all going to look like the UT game. UT has more talent than these other teams. But again, these, you know, these Iowa States, these Texas Techs, they, they're not even breaking a sweat. That's why you suck on third down because they can run it twice. And at the at worst, they're getting to third and one, third and two. There's so much wrong with this team. Neither line is good. And I'm seeing Sc Scotty B, my man, po posting that in the comment section. Yeah, the D-line coach is in question. So is the O-line coach. So is Eric Mateos because neither line can keep them in a game at all. At all. Yeah, Keetron Jackson gets hurt in the second quarter right before Baylor scores that first touchdown before halftime, gets his clock absolutely clean. It's a targeting penalty. TJ Tampa out for the game. And it sucks that you couldn't bring Keetron back in because I thought that would have really uh, exploited a matchup. TJ Tampa is one of the, maybe the best corner in this conference. And he goes down and you think, finally, the weather's getting better. Their number one corner's out. Let's pick these guys apart in the secondary. Nope. Nope. And I am interested if y'all will be willing to sign in creating a petition for Baylor to never play at home again. I love going to the games. It's fantastic. But for some reason, they hate playing at home. They hate it. I, I don't, I just don't get it. For a young team, especially on the, in, in, on the defensive side, even with some of the, the, I don't want to say toxic, but you know the way we've been hard on them this year for good reason, they don't want to play here. They're never ready to play here. They need to be on the road. I don't, I don't get it, man. You're going to have a real tough time in college football if you can't defend your home turf. You can't show a little bit of pride on your home turf. And week in, week out, whenever they're at McLean, it's a dumpster fire. It's a dumpster fire, man. Obviously, Texas State, Texas, Tech, and now Iowa State. Have they? I think Utah was the only game they've lost by single digits at home. They've won one, none against any FBS teams, and none of them have been within a touchdown or single digits. <sighs> How disheartening is that, man? I, I hate questioning guys' effort because they're out there every day, but their teammates have done it as well. It just looks like they're mailing it in. And it's too bad because this conference is wild enough this year that if you had brought a little bit more effort and a little bit more fight to the party, you'd probably be in a bowl game. But that's just such a far cry. And I, I don't, I just don't understand how every week with a defensive genius like Dave Aranda, and I know Matt Powledge is in his first year, but the lack of creativity on the defensive end, just nothing works for them. Nothing. And they're just getting gashed in the run game. That to me is that's a toughness thing. If we're eight weeks into the season and you've made no adjustments in stopping the run, that's a that's a toughness thing. That's a want to thing. Because there's clearly some focus there in that they don't they don't get penalized. But as I said earlier in the show, they're not getting penalized. They're not stupid. They're just bad. It's like the neighborhood I live in. I, I always say it's, it's not dangerous. It's just poor. And then I got carjacked in my driveway last week. So maybe that's not the best analogy. But that's what the team is. They're not stupid. They're just bad. They're just, they're just not good at football. And I know there, there are a lot of people in the comments and on social media calling for the head coach. I mean, I, I, I can't blame you at this point. I, I can't blame you. And I, I like the coach, and I, I like his schemes a lot of the time. Obviously not this year, but this is going to become a question in the offseason whether Baylor can afford to get rid of Dave Aranda. And with that, even if you can, how much can you pay the next guy? And from there, what's your NIL fund look like? Money is a problem for Baylor right now. I know they play poor a lot, and they raise tuition every year, but that starts to add up. Sell some beer at football games, make some good game day money there. I've just never seen a team that shows such competency on the road in the conference that can't play at home. 
you know, we've seen some bad teams here, and they were bad both on home on home turf and away from home. But never have I seen such a stark divide between a Baylor team that can play well on the road but not at home. It's it's super disheartening, and it makes for a hey, really uneventful last four weeks of the season. I mean, what do you play for? I, I don't even like their chances next week against what looked like a hapless Houston Cougars team. Of course, by Wednesday or Thursday, I'll talk myself into a Baylor victory, but the thing I hate the most is that they're playing it at home. Can we send it down to Houston, please? It's just such a poor, poor effort. Um, and I, I don't I don't know what to say because it's the same, it's the same stuff every week. They fall behind, they show a little bit of life, but no one on the sidelines could care any less. And they get gashed in the run game and they can't control the clock because they are always on the field and they suck on third down. I mean, it's the same thing every week. And luckily for Baylor, last week they played a team that was also really bad in almost all of those categories. And you outlasted them. You, you, you just did enough to win in that game. Final thing that I put down in my notes is where were the tight ends? Tight end room is one that I liked coming into the season. And I still think there's talent there. We're talking about you know Kelsey Johnson and Drake Dabney and uh, Jake Roberts, hopefully down, down the line here, Matthew Klopfenstein, who's gotten some touches this year, some action, but this seemed like a tailor-made game for them. They had a, The tight ends had a good game against Iowa State last year, which I again said was probably Blake's best game of the year last year, um, at least the one they played the whole way through. He looked good against West Virginia too. Um, uh, on a, a rain-soaked day today, we're a team that can't run the ball, I was expecting a big day for the tight ends in the passing game. Drake Dabney, two receptions for 21 yards. Kelsey Johnson, two receptions for five yards. Jake Roberts, one catch for 17 yards. Put him on a freaking milk carton. This, this whole tight end room is completely missing. And when your outside receivers can't play either, <laughs> you're SOL, guys. Especially when Keytron goes out in the first half. You're donezo. And I just, I don't get it for these guys that showed such flashes last year for an offense that is so tailored towards a tight end in the passing game. I mean, you heard, we heard it on the broadcast last week, Jake Roberts, when he scored his first touchdown, the transfer from UNT, he came to Baylor because, I mean, hey, it's a little step up, not this year, but it's an offense that is conducive to the tight end. It's an offense that should be putting tight ends in the NFL. Ben Sims in the NFL caught a couple passes last week for the Packers. It's not there. And it was still good last year, even for, even for a team that went 6-6. Six and six. Ben Sims had a real good year. Kelsey Johnson had a great end to the year. Drake Dabney was a real weapon before he got hurt against Tech in this same week last year. And they are just nothing, nothing. And now, who knows? Keytron Jackson might be out. Obviously, Hal Presley's out for basically the rest of the year because Dave said this week uh, he'll be back if there's a bowl game. There's no bowl game. So where is it coming from? Because it's just Monterey Baldwin right now in the passing game. And I feel for him. It's just him by himself. Another big game today. Six receptions, 117 yards, 69-yard touchdown. And, and, and what? And I, I almost even I, – I get so bored of saying this part, but – I'll go through the running stats, but you already know it's bad. They can't run the ball. Dawson Pendergrass, eight attempts for 37 yards, two touchdowns, four and a half yards of carry. Do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to keep Dawson Pendergrass on your roster. Whatever it takes. This kid's going to be a stud for them. I think the same about Bryson Washington. It looks like he's going to redshirt this year. This kid can freaking play. He can run, he can be a third down passing back, and he can block, which is something that is not easy for true freshmen to take on. He is going to be a star in the future. <clears throat> Dominic Richardson, 7 for 33. Nothing there. Jordan Neighbors had a jet sweep, went for no yards. Richard Reese, last year's Big 12 freshman of the year. Two carries, 
negative one yards. If you keep it score at home, that's not very good. And he has not been able to find space all year this year. I mean, congrats. He did it against Long Island. This is a setback. And it was something that I was afraid of when, when the start of the year was bad, was that he would pick it up and then enter the transfer portal. I don't know that he can now, even with the 900 yards, the freshman record last year. What are his prospects? And yeah, it's probably not all his fault. This line is, is not helpful at all, but two rushes for negative one? That's not going to get any coaches banging down your door in the Power Five. Dawson Pendergrass is the only bright spot they have in the backfield right now. Because again, as, as much as we talk about how bad the offensive line is, and it's true, he goes for two touchdowns, 4.6 4. a carry as a true freshman. God, you got to keep him on your roster. You just have to. And there, I think there are some talented freshmen on both sides of the ball for Baylor, mostly on the defensive side with the guys like Caden Jenkins and, and Tevin Williams as a sophomore um, and uh, um, Corey Gordon, Carl Williams back there, uh, DJ Coleman. There are some talented guys there, but um, you got to keep them on the roster because <laughs> – they're looking at this saying, hey, I'm getting some reps out here. I, I'm making some plays. That's going to put something on tape for the transfer portal. <clears throat> Today's music, Rico. I've given up on this team. Damn, man. Today's music has even given up on this team. I can't blame you. Today's music, Rico. <clears throat> I can't. I can't blame you. I mean, if you're a Baylor fan and, and you're living in Texas here, still come to the games. Sure, I'm a modder. But... Yeah, I mean, what do you expect from this team now? <laughs> they haven't played well on the road. They just played two bad teams on the road. I mean, I, they have played two bad teams on the road, but they've also played bad teams at home and lost. So, yeah, I think they have played well on the road. They just they outlasted those two teams. I mean, <laughs> clearly, Baylor is also bad. So they need to play well against bad teams to beat bad teams. So they've, they've done that. Good teams can find a way to pull out a win on the road, even if it's ugly. Yes, that's that's true. Um, I don't know. Oh, I just noticed we could do that. Put the comments on the screen. Sorry, guys, I'm stupid. If even if I, Yeah, I don't know how that relates to Baylor. They, they play well on the road, but they're not a good team. So Dave is not a defensive genius. I'll still push back on that one a little bit. Obviously, the defense stinks this year. I can't, I can't argue with that, but we saw it a lot in 2021, and we saw it even at times last year. Guy can coach up a defense, and his defense has won a national championship. So you can certainly question the effort. Yes, you can. I'm going through some old ones now, but I just like that it's on the screen. I think this was necess that this was on the effort portion a little bit. That's 1,000% on the head coach. Can't argue with you there. I really can't. The team is <clears throat> excuse me, never ready to play. They don't show any emotion on the sideline. They don't show much emotion on the field. They don't show much effort on the field. Yes, that is on the head coach. That is the culture of a program. And he is the one at the top of that, for better or for worse. It's, just, it's technically the same argument I use for Art Bryles. He's, it's the culture of the program. He's at the top. It's the same thing for Dave Aranda in terms of the effort on the field. <clears throat> Wouldn't necessarily blame the secondary because the defensive line can't get to the quarterback. There's only a certain limit the coverage can hold. I'll agree with that. Yeah, and I actually don't think the secondary is nearly the worst part of this team. Again, it's very young, too. And I've liked, they've had some good games, actually, the secondary. But you're right. The defensive line can't get to a quarterback, and they can't stop a run either. So I don't know why you don't drop 11 into coverage, because it's totally, totally useless back there. And TJ Franklin has been a great servant to this team in his four years at Baylor. Where the heck has he been? Why can't he get to a quarterback? Gabe Hall, my man, Gabe Hall, who I hear about every year how much of a freak he is. And in his best season in 2021, they were, <clears throat> excuse me, really keyed on actual pass rushers. And Gabe Hall got some moments in the sun. He got a good game against Tech last year. And since then, again, put him on a milk carton. Preseason All Big 12. Everyone said this might be your only preseason, your only. First team All Big 12 player. He shouldn't get anywhere near that All Big 12 team. Nowhere near it. I have not understood the hype around him for the last two years. I was hoping I'd be wrong. 
Turns out I'm right again, and it sucks because he's nowhere to be found. I think it's a matter of talent. Yeah, it's. I, I, I go back and forth on this one. Clearly, they don't have the talent out there. Like I've said this whole show, they stink. They're not stupid. They're just not good right now. And part of that is having a lot of young guys out there. It's not a good enough excuse for sure, but I'm. that's why I go back and forth. Is it... <coughs> Is it just the coach? Is it having a lot of young guys out there? Or is it the fact that the young or the old guys out there aren't very good? And I think it's a combination of all three. The complete unwillingness and inability to make in-game adjustments. They end the game like they start the game. G-Code Jedi, I can't agree with you more. I can't agree with you more for the exception of one game this year. They have not finished the game like they have started the game. Or, no, they have. They have finished the game like they started the game. For the one game, which is UCF, they did the opposite, where they, they came back and they really played well in that fourth quarter, best fourth quarter in years for the Bears. But for every other game, they've sucked to start and they've sucked to finish. And so when Dave Aranda comes out after the games and said, hey, we just need to finish, I push back on this against Texas Tech I'll push back on it again. You need to start. You need to start, and then you need to finish. But yeah, that is the case. Where does Baylor go from here? We'll we'll break down a, a little bit more on Monday on what is wrong with this team and what they can do going forward. But what is there left to play for? Drop it down in the comments. We'll be back on Monday. Thank you so much for making it your first listen today and every day. I really appreciate y'all coming along for the ride. What are you guys looking forward to for the rest of the season? Because I'm going to be asking myself that as well. This has been, always will be, Locked on Baylor.